As you can see, there has been a definite setup change going on. I got a mic, upgraded a little bit of the background. I think this looks a little bit neater. Having me at a further distance feels pretty weird to be far away from you, but I miss you guys a lot and I am happy to start Unchained season two. This is the second season now for really our Formula One family. And we're starting it off with a banger on an overhaul for the three top teams and how it's gonna really kick off for Red Bull, Ferrari, and Mercedes, and how it impacts the actual other teams as well, all together. There's a lot of news coming out. It is mainly rumors, but also information that we can use going into 2024, what to expect with these new cars. So I wanted to start it off talking about Red Bull, then Ferrari, then Mercedes, because each team has different impacts that are coming for it to make the most out of this car. As I said, Starting off with Red Bull, the biggest thing and what I wanted to know was for Red Bull was they failed their crash impact structure. So this has kind of been talked about recently in the media and I think it's a big thing to go over because a lot of people are making a bigger fuss out of something that's really nothing. Now what do I mean by that? Why do I say it's nothing? Well to me it's nothing because most teams and really Alpine already did it as well will fail these crash structure tests the first time. But why is that? Because they're going for the lightest weight possible. If you actually succeed on them, your chassis is a bit overweight. It's important to go for these at the very smallest amount of weight that they can possibly do because weight distribution in these chassis, as you can see in the W14, really failed it. So actually getting it right and correct is super important, especially for these newer ground effect cars because the weight distribution will then actually dictate how the car feels on whether it's front end or rear end. And for the W14, the biggest issue was that it was front end oriented. The RB19 practically had it down, so did the RB18. So them actually failing this doesn't really mean much. It means that they're going to the extreme, which is something that we can kind of expect with Red Bull. Red Bull is that team that takes to the extreme and actually puts in their full force when making a car. That's why they're so successful. They don't actually make any mistakes when it comes to this, so I wouldn't be too worried. Same thing with Alpine, because Alpine actually just came, recently came out with the whole entire kind of crash structure or failure. It's really not that big of a deal. I wouldn't even make a big fuss out of it. But for this car, what should we expect? So Max came out, talked about it a little bit in the media. He actually talked about the impact of the car and what he thinks needs to change over his driver input. And it's one thing, and obviously, if you've been keeping up with the 2022 season, you're kind of going to know what I'm saying. It's slow speed corners and curbing. That's really kind of been their only issue. Now, the funny part with the slow speed is, in Monaco, they were still super strong. So it didn't really affect them that badly. But the curbing in Singapore with those 90 degree angles really hurt the car. Now, this has to do with their ride height. So it's not like this is something that they can completely change and now have a amazing car there and and everything else you have to have some compromise and i think they're willing to compromise one race in the whole entire season for their cars still to be a beast which will be the rb20 i mean pull up even this beautiful picture of what probably will be the rb20 it's going to be a very strong car and will they be able to get down on this they did somewhat with a couple of their updates help them with curbing but it's just ride height, honestly. Ride height is kind of where the car is at. So if the ride height of the car is set to a lower ride height, they'll be a lot better in high speed and other tracks and low speed, but not really for Singapore. But they can afford to take the hit. At least I think so. Now let's talk about Ferrari. Ferrari is actually saying that they're changing 95% of their car. I feel like we're going to get this very often with Ferrari and Mercedes and Red Bull. Red Bull actually says it's going to be another evolution. I mean... Why would they even try making a revolution for the already successful RB19? They just need to make a little bit of a better version because it's going to be tough for teams to catch up. But can they catch up? They absolutely can. Absolutely for 2024, Ferrari and Mercedes are the top dogs catching up. Obviously McLaren is pretty close there, but I'll talk about those impacts with Mercedes as to how it can help McLaren. As Ferrari, 95% of a change for the car. What does this mean? So they're also going to be testing that chassis to the maximum with their crash test, being able to get the most out of the weight. But the main important part is the air distribution on the car. They're saying with this new car, it's not, while it will be a huge change, they're not necessarily 
taking everything out of the car. They're still taking what works, but putting it all together. It was a very successful qualifying car. I think suspension is mainly where Ferrari was lacking at because their tires were really killing them on the impact and just in general wear on the car was bad. That really destroyed them and reliability in the beginning of the year. I mean, I think we tend to forget Leclerc literally had a 10 place grid penalty in Saudi. That's so embarrassing from the Ferrari team. And that was because they had a couple of issues, I think, with the electronic system. This is just slow things that they need to sort out. It wasn't a good start to Vasseur, but then he really proved how strategy improved, how pit stops have been a big thing for them, how in general the car was more stable by the end of the year. And I already made a video talking about it, but it's going more into that Charles Leclerc direction, which to me is a huge thing. They need to go towards their number one driver. Carlos is great. I love Carlos, but being able to actually push that car in a direction to where a driver will feel a lot more comfortable for Charles Leclerc, who is just that qualifying monster, and in general, a race pace monster too, it's the right direction. They need to go stick with one guy, stick with their guts, and push at it. That's how Michael Schumacher was successful. That's actually how Max Verstappen is successful at the moment, and Mercedes really needs to take a hint out of that for Lewis Hamilton, which I will talk about in just a moment. All for that though, the Ferrari car and its 95% change, expect the front wing to be changed, rear wing, but mainly the chassis and where that weight distribution goes. They had a pretty front ended car in 2023. I still expect the same because that's kind of how Leclerc likes driving, so does Verstappen. It seems like that's the quickest way possible for a car. So expect still a front ended car, but a lot to be changed, especially in that chassis area because we know that it had that little side impact structure popping out of the side pod. It's obviously not going to affect the airflow that badly, but it still does affect it to some degree and it could impact it for the future if they continue to go with this side impact structure. So that will change on the car. And the last team that I want to get into that impacts the most teams actually is for Mercedes. For Ferrari, obviously Haas is going to impact because Haas just copies the Ferrari car and they're the off-brand Ferrari. But Haas, doesn't matter you put a rocket ship in that thing, still will somehow fail or shred its tires. Now for Mercedes, this impacts Aston Martin and McLaren to a degree. The first thing I want to look at is the actual diffusers on the McLaren car and the Aston Martin car. So the diffuser on the Aston Martin car is the exact same that it is on the Mercedes car. So this gives you the best actual idea of how the gearbox is structured in the car and how it negatively actually impacts the car. It impacts it negatively because it's a little too big, so the actual distribution of air going back to the diffuser pulling there more for their obviously DRS effectiveness and really straight line speed in general is worser on the AMR 23 than the McLaren. McLaren makes their own gearbox and they make their own suspension. The only thing they pick up is the engine. And for McLaren, the best way this will be impacted for them is the engine is changing its philosophy as it's not really a no side pod engine, but it's trying to pull the best parts out of the engine make it a little bit more reliable, open it up in comparison to what it is now, because they actually have to sacrifice a little bit of performance. These are rumors. I want to state that big time because it is being talked about and yes, it probably will change, but horsepower really won't be that big of a factor for this Mercedes car, unless they literally pull something illegal out of them. It should not make that big of a difference. It'll just help with air distribution and how they want to make that chassis now. So. For both McLaren and for Aston Martin, it helps for airflow to the back of the car, but for Aston Martin, it's a way bigger impact than it is for McLaren. Because it actually helps with straight line speed, they were one of the teams trying to figure out the drag. They actually had a really quick car in Coda. I think it was quick in a couple other places too. Their car wasn't as bad on drag as I think we thought it was. In the beginning of the year, it was pretty badly impacted by it. But by the end of the year, it got a lot better with a different side pod design and the undercut. But it obviously lost performance in the cornering, so this should help it out. McLaren still expect them to be super strong, have the right suspension, have the right setup in the car. Super good in high speed, but they need to take the drag out. Will this help them? Somewhat. That's kind of what I'm expecting. Now, speaking of that, though, the big team, Merck. How does this help them? Helps them big time. First of all, we know for weight distribution. I talked about it with Ferrari. I'm going to massively state it for Mercedes. We know Lewis complained about the front end of the car being a little too much for him and really not how he wants to drive a car. George handled it a little bit better in the beginning of the time in 2022 and 2023, but he wasn't a fan of it either. No team is if the car isn't fast enough. 
and obviously it wasn't quicker than it needed to be. So they're going to actually change the weight distribution. They're probably going to have some actual impact it fails. It's not a big deal. Don't let anybody make you think it is a big deal because it's really not. So yes, expect that from them. Changing up the chassis. Now the front wing is where I was kind of interested to see how they're going to go about it with this car. Yes, it's going to have a 90 to 95% difference in the actual interior. Now when it comes to the outside, we'll have to see because weight distribution and how that chassis is made is what will impact everything from the outside that we're looking at. So it's big to know that the most important parts of the car are things that we do not see. And that's kind of where I think Mercedes is really going to be changing up a lot of that chassis and the interior, probably from the side pod work and the, as we talked about with the engine. That is where Mercedes could come up clutch, will help the other teams as I impacted. And I mean, it'll probably make even Williams even faster in that straight line. But yes, this is to start off our 2024. I wanted to talk about the 2024 cars and everything that we've had so far. I hope you guys like the way this looks. I think it looks a lot better, a lot neater. And I am so glad to be back. Miss you guys. Thank you so much for even sticking around. I've been seeing you guys viewing and you already know this is going to be the year that we take over. So thank you so much for watching on the channel. Hopefully I sound a lot sexier with this mic, but thank you guys for supporting the channel and being around. Please leave a like, subscribe. It would mean the world and peace.